Hello, everyone, and welcome to the How to Gay podcast. This is Paz, and I'm recording episode two for the week of September 6th, 2021. How are you? I'm doing decently. With summer pretty much over here in the US now that Labor Day has passed, and that Starbucks has started using the phrase pumpkin spice, I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the competitive reality shows that came and went on my TV. Side note, I don't drink coffee, so I wouldn't mind a pumpkin spice chai, but it's not time yet, no matter who says otherwise. But along with the TV overviews, I saw two movies and wanted to give my honest reviews. Those movies, Respect and Cinderella. Both movies with singers turned actresses. Neither a home run. (laughs) I'm getting ahead of myself, though. For the TV part, I wanted to give a little bit about myself. I used to cover television for a few different websites, and my specialty over the times was competitive reality. So I've always had a soft spot for those shows. And I still can't believe that The Amazing Race is now 20 years old. The first season had payphones. The first season was pre-9-11. But this is the How to Gay podcast. I do want to focus a little bit on the gay representation on the show. Let's start off with America's Got Talent. I'm not a huge fan of most of the acts this year. I do love the world taekwondo team. They at least represent something I haven't seen in this television realm. Of the quarterfinalists and semifinalists, I want to talk about the Beyond Belief Dance Company. I get that the dance company is a new generation of dancers, but I do want to note that they competed back in season three. It's weird that we keep going back to the same group, when I'm sure there are tons of other talented dance groups out there. You and I both know why this group is on this season. Alyssa Edwards. Alyssa is so well known in the drag race community that I'm sure the show hoped that they can get some kind of viewership boost. I took a look at their quarterfinal performances on YouTube, and here are some of the comments from the YouTube section. You can tell these are Alyssa's girls. They slayed. Kudos to Justin, who looks amazing. I love you, Alyssa. Where is Alyssa? Great job, girls, but I was hoping Alyssa would also be there. I mean, that speaks for itself right there. Their dance routines were good. They had good formations, good stunts. But it felt like the moves and sass were a lot more of the same. I actually would have loved to see them on America's Best Dance Crew instead of the show, still coached by Alyssa. Then at least it also has, like, the Viacom MTV connection. Did having Alyssa on boost their odds? No. They were either 7th or 8th out of 12 in their quarterfinal. They got wildcarded in by the judges and performed in the first semifinal, and they finished at best 7th out of 11. I gotta imagine that they finished 10th, with all the singers splitting the vote too many times. Is it good to have representation like Alyssa Edwards, aka Justin, on America's Got Talent? Of course. Are these 12-year-old something being forced to do somewhat sexualized routines and clothes that are a little odd? Possibly. I wish them the best, though, and maybe we'll find that Alyssa Edwards will have another team on in a future season. MTV's Challenge is a big guilty pleasure for me, and while last season had no gay men on, this time around there are two gay men competing on Spies, Lies, and Allies. I hate the subtext of this show. Just call it Challenge like 47 or whatever it is these days. Corey Lay from 12 Dates of Christmas, a show I've never heard of before, and Huey, is it Mowen? I can't pronounce last names for the life of me. Mowen? Mowen? I should check his um, UK-based Dancing with the Stars uh, competition. I think that's Dancing with the Stars Ireland to see if they say his name. But before that, he was on Big Brother 17, the UK version. Both ended up in the bottom a few episodes ago, and one eliminated the other. 
I'm going to leave it that vague and spoiler free. The problem I had was that the two of them then started fighting afterwards, because they probably thought it was easier to eliminate the other. It's the quintessential layup on the show. Everyone on this season is eliminating the rookies. And that's always been a concept on this show. It just seems like this is the main plotline of the first few episodes, especially this season. So Huey starts to cry out about how they were both gay and they both should have had each other's backs. It's true. On an MTV show like this, racial representation hasn't been bad at all. Sexuality representation has been hit and miss. As I mentioned, last season had no one. And it would be an easy get to get at least one person. And I mean that as a a gay man. I'm pretty sure they're just going to keep asking Casey who kind of hits both Latina and lesbian. To make it even better television, if they asked me, they should have voted to take on Emmanuel. It would have been a great storyline of either him or his snuggle buddy, Michelle, because one of them would have had to been eliminated. See, I could write reality TV. When you're a gay man on a very macho-driven show like The Challenge, you have to prove your worth. As much of an annoying contestant as he was, Frank Sweeney from the second battle of the seasons and other seasons within that time frame proved that you could be strong and a good thinker to make it to the end. Unfortunately for this season, it looks like the gay man won't win this one. Speaking of having each other's backs, I'm very much okay with Big Brother 23. It's good to know when an alliance of six can make it to the final eight most likely Final 7 by the time you hear this, without self-destructing. The cookout was smart in their execution, and of the six, I'd personally like to see a Tiffany or Hannah win, but I wanted to talk a little bit about Derek Frazier. He's the son of Smoke and Joe Frazier, the boxer, and he comes off a little suspect on TV. He thinks he's a character that people really like, and to me that's annoying. Play the game play the game to win. I know that the producers will force feed questions to make you feel emotional in the diary room, but even outside of the diary room, he's he's playing weird for me. The big controversy for me is that he's convinced that as a gay man, he can call a woman a bitch, especially calling Tiffany a bitch after a few fights. And it's not some sassy retort like, oh, bitch, please, or being the HBIC. No one has the authority to call anyone names. This is why so much of the LGBT plus community is divided. I'm going to sigh when someone brings Derek F. to the finals in hopes that they could say that they played a much better game. And then the bitter jury will vote for Derek as an anti-Tiffany or anti-Kyland or anti-X. I'm hoping that Derek X and Claire will guide the other jurors to think with their heads and not their hearts. The last piece of news actually slipped in earlier right before I finished recording. Starting to take a look at the fall lineup of television, Dancing with the Stars just announced a new cast. The one person who matches this podcast conversation is Cody Rigsby. Cody Rigsby is a Peloton instructor who has over 800,000 followers on Instagram, and I have no clue who he is. He's also a professional dancer, which is mildly suspect, but on this season with him, Jojo Siwa, a former Rockette, a Olympic gymnast, I can let it slide a little bit. I'm sure there was better options out there. I have a feeling he was willing to be paid a lower amount than some celebrities were, combined with he does represent the gay community. From what I've read, he is proudly out. So kudos to him. Personally speaking, my vote, without watching any of them dance, is going to The Miz. As I mentioned, I love the challenge. I watched The Real World way back in the day when he was in Real World Back to New York, And, you know, I remember him and Coral all the time on The Real World, and any time they paired them off in The Challenges was amazing. If The Miz can make it to the end of the season, 
when they start doing the interviews on how hard of a worker X celebrity was. For example, when Nelly started making it to the end, out of nowhere we got an interview where Kelly Rowland was there and she started singing a little bit of Dilemma. I really want the producers, if The Miz makes it there, to have Coral say something. Like, you know, how she can crush someone with one boob. I don't know. Just have her on there. That would be, like, nostalgia right there. Have her, if there is an audience, sit in the audience and just clap. That's all I need. (laughs) But in the end, if you want to see Cody make it through week after week, you have to vote for him. Well, it's time for me to take a quick break, but when we get back, Aretha Franklin and Camilla Cabello. Yeah, I am kind of confused too that I have to talk about an, a former American Idol contestant and a former X Factor contestant. Well, hmm. While I contemplate that, I am going to take a quick break, and I will see you soon. <laughs> Learn how to develop your skills. Learn from Fiverr is an online, on-demand, video classes platform, specially tailored for freelancers and professionals. All classes are taught by top experts who are distinguished in their fields. These courses contain practical and comprehensive knowledge and exercises, quizzes, and tests. By taking a course, you will level up your skills and grow professionally. And by successfully passing the course's final quiz, you'll showcase your new capabilities. Learn how to turn your brand into the next best thing. Click on my link in the description slash show notes and sign up today. In one of my favorite TV shows, this time non-reality, Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, a mantra that pops up is that life doesn't make narrative sense. This is the flaw with following the life of Aretha Franklin. I think the other weird disconnect I had with the biopic was that Aretha Franklin died three years ago. In my head, that's like two, because COVID COVID, and that's like a time jump. At the end of the film, the producers chose to display Aretha performing at the Kennedy Center Honors for Carole King in 2015. They strategically cut out any reaction shots of Carol basically fangirling and yes, queening. (laughs) Also, Obama tearing up. She then takes off her huge fur coat and just belts to the bleachers. (sighs) Ah, chef's kiss. Seriously. It's weird, though. Carol King is a throwaway sentence in the movie, and it's not like Aretha is getting the honor. Jennifer Hudson had a lot to live up to. From what I read, Aretha handpicked Hudson for the biopic. This also confuses me about why National Geographic decided to do an Aretha miniseries. It's very much like the Ants, Bugs Life, when movies all come out and it's the same exact plot. Now, just for clarification, I didn't watch the National Geographic miniseries. This review just covers respect. But I'm digressing. I think Jennifer Hudson does a great job with the material she's given. Unfortunately, it's a lot of a man berates Aretha Franklin tells her that she has quote-unquote demons because she drinks, and she finds hope in the memories of her mother and the church. I get that Aretha fought her way to get her sound and to find her voice, but it made the movie feel really uneven. Again, you can't just sacrifice movie tempo for real-life events. People will call you out on the tone. Random aside, Did you know that Aretha Franklin's version of Winter Wonderland was released during the Columbia Records era? That was covered in the movie. Those were her somewhat unsuccessful jazz albums before the I Never Loved a Man and Respect were released. Even if it's iconic now, and you hear it at the mall everywhere, that would make even less narrative sense to mention. So it was cut. But we had a missed opportunity for a Jennifer Hudson version. The best parts of the movie was the music. Jennifer Hudson is a natural on stage. Her voice, I feel, pushes harder than Aretha's, but she tried her best to merge both styles together. The creation of the songs are fun to see. Hudson as Aretha in front of the piano trying to mix respect with her sisters, finding her sound with the predominantly white backing band. Now those were good moments. 
I just felt weird putting in this storyline of Aretha knows Martin Luther King Jr. I get it, she's a strong black female with the voice she wants to use. Everything that wasn't singing, though, took a backseat. One real nitpick that I couldn't unsee once I saw it in the movie was every time they would use photos of magazine covers or record covers to transition you between time frames. Why did it look like they photoshopped Jennifer Hudson's face onto Aretha Franklin's body? They couldn't just do a quick photo shoot and recreate the photo. It didn't have to be 100% accurate, and it would have looked better than what they gave us. Or just use the pictures of Aretha Franklin. At that point, we kind of accept the fact that Jennifer Hudson is not Aretha Franklin. Maybe she just photographs really weird. Okay, rant over. On to the how is this gay. Outside of the whole diva concept, Titus Burgess. I normally imagine him as an over-the-top, flamboyantly gay guy. I know him as the Sebastian the Crab on Broadway. In this film, he plays gospel singer James Cleveland, and he kills it. It's warm, it's understanding, it's forgiving, he's respectful of the role he's given, and he vibes really well with Jennifer Hudson on screen. The other part of this story is such an underdog tale where you keep trying, you fight, you find your groove. And as any minority would know, it's hard out there. Aretha had four passable, possibly not great jazz albums, though I'm sure someone goes back, listens to it, says Aretha Franklin killed it because she's Aretha Franklin. But on the Columbia scale, it was not as successful. She even had kids by then. Granted, one of the kids happened when she was 12, but still, she had kids with it. She can do it. You can do it. I can do it. I have to give this movie a B-. Visually, it's a good-looking movie. It honors Aretha Franklin's legacy with, ironically, respect. It's just very uneven. Now, going from one somewhat serious film to a more frivolous one, the Amazon version of Cinderella starring Camilla Cabello. Oh, geez. What can I say about this thing? It's a twist on the classic. I'm not sure if this is everyone's cup of tea, but I give the whole production and staff credit for trying. But they tried, and on a whole, I think they failed. Let's start with the positives. I genuinely liked Camilla Cabello in this movie. She has a nice onstage presence that she may have gained after years of performing on stage, but there was something likable and believable about her on screen. I sort of wanted to root for her, if I liked the movie a lot. She's that quirky friend, the one that hasn't left the basement, and her singing didn't annoy me. And I could tell the difference between her voice and Tate McRae's now. (laughs) <laughs> I felt bad for Minnie Driver and Pierce Brosnan. This was clearly a paycheck for them. As for Edina Menzel, she wanted to make an unlikable character in The Stepmother as a sympathetic one. Uh, it doesn't work great for me. I remember Edina on Glee, and her voice in the pop songs is very hit or miss. I think her performing Material Girl was a complete miss. Next to me on Glee? That was a good fit. The part of Let's Get Loud that slows down and has Camilla and Edina singing together? That works. Now, Nicholas Galitzine. I think that's how you pronounce his last name. I'll be honest, I have never seen any of his films, so I had to look up that he was in High Strung or The Craft Legacy. But if Cinderella is any gauge of his acting skills... You should have just put Camilla Cabello with a sack of potatoes, and it would have done a better job. His singing skills are atrocious, his lip-syncing abilities look painful, he was just there. He was just pretty and there. Most of the time I went to myself, I would like to wear his boots. That was about it. I thought maybe it was just me being a little bit bitchy. So I tried to listen to the soundtrack without any visuals. Camilla Cabello does laps around Nicholas in Perfect. Somebody love? Oh my god, that's awful, don't even listen to it. 
Here are two more nitpicks. The CGI mice look awful. I didn't care much for James Corden. I never really did. I'm familiar with both James Acaster and Ramesh because of their time on the show Taskmaster, which is an amazing show, by the way. Highly recommended. Go out there, seek it out, watch it. I'm sure someone illegally uploads it, like on YouTube or something. They did fine. (laughs) James Corden. Ah. The other nitpick, why was there even a town crier? I felt like they wanted to add in some sort of Hamilton spoken rap narration, and they forced it in twice in the movie. You didn't need either sections. There could have been a smarter way to announce that there was a story plotline happening. As for the gay part, the obvious one is Billy Porter. He's great in the uh, nine minutes that he got in this movie. I don't think it was a stretch at all. He was just being a sassy fairy god person. The song Shining Star fit him, and the performance went perfectly. I'm a little jealous because he looked great in orange, and I don't look good in orange at all. (laughs) There is one minor gay aspect that I also want to touch on. Trans feminine actor Jeanne Le Lachure plays Count Wilbur. Before I continue to nitpick, good for the team for hiring someone that identifies as trans feminine. That being said, I don't get who Count Wilbur was. Was Count Wilbur in love with the prince? If Count Wilbur was the prince's best friend, then why did the prince have two other people in his posse who clearly look like they are also really close friends? with the prince. It it just didn't make any sense. And I appreciate that, you know, the camera would give extra lingering stares, but why? Okay, I'm going to inch towards a grade. But first, have you ever seen the YouTube group Patty Cake Productions? They do jukebox versions of fairy tales. So Cinder Swift was their Cinderella meets Taylor Swift. The Grande Mermaid was their Ariana Grande meets The Little Mermaid. They put the music from The Greatest Showman, but then decided to put it on top of the history of Walt Disney. They were basically better put together than this film. Their CGI mice in Cinder Swift looked better. Okay, I'm going to stop with the mice part. I, I really, I can't keep going. This movie is colorful. The choreography is good. The scenery is beautiful. Some of the camera angle choices look like someone cared. Camilla Cabello is a standout. I can imagine Million to One being an American Idol coronation song, but it's not going to be in the best original song contention at all. Unfortunately, this film is something you could leave on in the background to distract your kids for a little bit because you've seen way too many of the other Disney Plus things, and just wanted to change. It's very safe for work kind of thing. I am going to have to give Cinderella a C-. I'm pretty much out of ranting time. I think I need to cool down a little bit and grab a little bit of water. So I wanted to just give my random recommendations and my goodbyes. This week's random recommendation... Since we're talking about Aretha Franklin, have you ever seen Aretha Franklin cover Mariah Carey's song, Touch My Body? There are live clips, a few of them online, not the full versions, I really wish it would just pop up somewhere. Maybe I have to look up a full Aretha uh, concert from that time frame. And it proves one, Aretha can sing anything and it sounds great. Two. Aretha isn't afraid to make fun of herself. And I honestly think that's the key to life. Don't take yourself too seriously. That being said, please make sure you like and subscribe this. On whatever podcast form you're listening to, please leave good feedback. It really helps me out. If you'd like to catch me on the socials, on both Instagram and on Twitter, I am this underscore is underscore Paz. On Facebook, you just mush those all together without the underscores. So thank you so much for listening. And remember, we'll get it right next time. Bye, guys.